My friend Alan Arnold was with us again, second time. We talked about his book, The Eden Option, a uh, small little book, a winsome book. He referred to it as, and it is. Yeah. You want to read the, you should read the definition. It's a six by six book. So it's easy to hand out and, and get a bunch yeah. of copies. And we would, we would encourage people to do that. But he starts off with a C.S. Lewis quote here. He says, when the whole world is running towards a cliff, he who is running in the opposite direction appears to have lost his mind. And the whole concept of this book is, are you living story number one or story number two? And he goes back to Eden to kind of unlock yes. what story number one is all about. And it's all about co-creating with God. It's all about seeing things from God's perspective. Uh, I think this is going to be a very, very eye-opening book for people takes us back to the beginning. I love that he talks about if you want to know who you are and you want to step into the best story, you've got to start at the beginning. And he takes us back to, to Eden and what it was to be in union, which is my favorite subject. And man, it's a good conversation. And we, we got personal on the front end. He shared a little bit of his personal story, how the book was birthed. Yeah. Uh, and then we went wide afield. He is a storyteller. He's He's written several other books, some of them more narrative driven. And that's the invitation. You know, we've, we do this all the time. We talk about story one and story two. That's all we're doing. We've used different language for it. You know, I've referred to it as different paradigms or different narratives, but uh, that's what we're doing in this is Alan is helping us rediscover who we are. So love this conversation. Appreciate you guys being on the journey with us. Man, I love doing this podcast with you, Derek. Yeah, Jason, I love doing it with you. And let me encourage our listeners to go and review the podcast. It helps get it out there. And then consider a donation to a family story. Uh, Jason is a nonprofit. His ministry uh, runs on the charitable donations of people just like you who listen to this podcast. And if it's been at all meaningful for you in the content that we cover, um, go and make a donation to a family story. I think that, uh, it'll bless you. <laughs> yeah. Grateful man. Uh, <laughs> yeah. All right. Without further ado, this is Alan Arnold. I mean, that's the thing we've connected right. around and our hearts have burned with, uh, I, you're the guy that, you know, you've been helpful in me writing over the years. You've been a great encourager, but not just in the practical stuff, just in helping us find, uh, our original story and, and and I'm always encouraged when we when we connect because that's what happens we slow things down we talk about whiskey and tacos well and, and don't forget tequila <laughs> yes I always do don't I no whiskey like whiskey and tequila <laughs> <laughs> so maybe we start there though man and uh I am so thankful that you're here this is the second time we're gathering around this book, The Eden Option, my friend Alan Arnold. And you guys have met uh, Alan and Derek uh, last time. And I think uh, your other book, yeah. Chaos Can't, we talked about that. Yeah. I really love that. That was a, such a great concept. But I like your analogy, Alan, what you said earlier about um, dropping the needle on the vinyl. And you can pick any spot that you want to start. And But you you wanted to start at the beginning and I love, I think that fits right into the name of the Eden concept. So why don't you, why don't you tell us a little bit about the, you know, the difference between story one and story two. Uh, I like how you shape it as um, yeah. God reality Yes, and how we're not necessarily living in our God reality. Give us a little bit of that concept right from the beginning. Yeah, Derek. Well, so what I found incredibly helpful about the journey that God's had me on is to really begin by questioning what I assume is reality. And, and it, it feels, it will feel as we talk about this a little bit like the matrix and yeah. going deeper down the rabbit hole, Alice in Wonderland, whatever analogy you want to compare it to. But, but here's why I think all of us are born into the wrong story. And that's what I would call story two. Story two is us trying to make things happen mostly in our own strength, without a real belief that either there is a God or that God will come through or engage with us in a personal way. And so story two is mostly story on our terms, story as we try to put it together 
it's it's an Ecclesiastes story, really, to use a, a reference from scripture, and that it's a minus that won't add up. You know, in, in the message translation, Eugene Peterson describes the first chapter of Ecclesiastes, he'll say things like, it's a minus that won't add up. Nothing is making sense. And we come to accept that is reality when really it's just our norm. So we start to associate what we're used to, what we see around us, what feels normal as reality. But I really believe it's more unreality. And and what I mean by that is if God is the most real thing in the universe, and I think all three of us would say, yes, he is, and that's true. Well, then the further we get from God with our story, the less real it becomes, the less real, in a sense, we become because we are pursuing things that are less real, less true, less good. And as we do, we become less. And so that story, too, it's a story we're born into, but we have a choice whether to stay in it or to move into the story we were created for. And the story we were created for, I would call story one. And that is the Eden option. The option is, do we want to stay in the broken story that doesn't add up and define our life in those terms, our children in those terms, our career in those terms, even the God that most people are moving away from right now and losing interest in and giving up on is a story to God. It's not the God. It's the God of story two, which is not who God is. It's how we've come to see and learn and define God. So story one is a story we have to return to, but it's the original Eden story that we were created for. And story one is a story with God at the epicenter. And when we step into that, well, then we can actually, and we can go into this a little later, hopefully, but we can reclaim some things Adam and Eve gave up because Adam and Eve were the only two beings born into story one. And they made a choice. Their option was to leave it for something else that they thought would give more life than God. And everyone since then, every person, our parents, grandparents, all the way back in time have been born in the wrong story because of Adam and Eve's choice. And so we have to make the opposite decision Adam and Eve did. We are born in story two. We get to choose story one where they were born in story one and left paradise, left God at the epicenter. And um, the, the thing I would just add to that is this really is a message I believe mostly, it's for everyone, but it's mostly for believers because Adam and Eve, when they chose the wrong tree, they didn't stop believing in God. Like they stayed in story two, they went into that and stayed believers. They, they hid from the first thing they did after they chose the wrong tree was hide from God. So you don't hide from something you don't believe in. So they stayed believers in story two. They just believed the wrong things about God in themselves. And so when I talk to people about the Eden option, I'm like, you know, yes, I'm, I'm first going after believers with this because believers are in the wrong story and it, and it defines and limits everything in their life until they get into the true story. You, we were talking, uh, we just got on and you talked about where to start with this book and how you'd been living it for years. And, and then God, uh, does what he does and reminded you, uh, <laughs> basically the, the best approach is to start at the beginning, essentially. Right. Right. And I know you had, um, I know a little bit about this because we've talked about it, uh, at times, uh, mostly after I wasn't aware at the time, but share a little bit about losing your voice, finding it again, and then some of the walls you ran up against. Yeah, absolutely. So about two years ago, almost to the day, like this period, two years ago, I had several back-to-back speaking engagements and was going nonstop morning to evening. And during that time, it was fine. My voice was strong, but a few days after... I lost about 80% of my voice and it sounded like I was, uh, well, John Eldridge told me, dude, it sounds like you've been smoking about three packs of camel a day <laughs> unfiltered. Like, cause I could bear, I was hoarse, raspy and had no strength in my voice. 
And I just assumed, well, you know, I, okay, I overtaxed it, give it a day or two, rest it, it'll come back. Well, I tried everything, guys. I tried not speaking. I had a whiteboard and my kids love that because they just look the other direction. And so I would write a question to them and they would just whoop, go the other way and, you know, pretend they didn't see me. And so they loved it. I didn't really love it. Um, but after trying, you know, not speaking and after trying um, some home remedies, you know, to, to soothe my throat, nothing worked. So I saw an ENT, ear, nose, throat specialist, and he, he looked uh, down my throat, put a camera down there and put it up on a big screen and said, yeah, you've got these nodules. And he said, you know, until you have surgery, you will not have your voice back. It, it happens to speakers and, and, you know, singers all the time, but this is the only way to get around that. And the soonest I can do that for you would be a few months. So it was a really, you know, on the one hand, enlightening conversation because I, I felt like I knew the cause. But on the other hand, a few more months of not speaking. And I spend a lot of my time on podcast and in, in teaching and coaching. Yeah. So I set the appointment. It was a few months later by this time. And the surgery is coming up like two days from now at this point. And I felt like this is it. This is the chance to finally get my voice back. And I'm out working in my yard. And I just, since God say, set everything down and just sit down. I want to talk to you. And so I did. Okay. It was a hot summer day. And God said, you know, Alan, do you want story one or story two with this? Well, I had never heard those terms. Right. And I didn't really, I didn't, I didn't know what that meant. So I like, right. You know, it's, it's kind of like somebody saying, do you want door number one, door number two in the old game? Show? And you're like, I have no idea. Like, is it just total randomness? I don't know how to even answer. And I've, I've learned enough to know over time that when God asks a question like that, he's inviting conversation and he's inviting a journey. And so I started asking him questions. What does that mean? What is story one, story two? And and ultimately, within, I sensed him saying, story one, Alan, is something that few people choose. It's walk with me into faith and mystery and yeah. unknown with no guarantees other than I'll be with you. Um, and story two is, which is fine, do the procedure, see the doctor and let that play out. And I immediately knew Jason and Derek, like if I chose story two, probably everything would be fine. And, and doctors, you know, are really good at what they do. And this doctor would have probably done super well, but I would have never known what story one was. And I couldn't live with that. Like I literally could not go through the rest of my life, not knowing what God was inviting me into. And so I canceled the surgery that Monday after the weekend. And I knew when I was canceling it, God had not guaranteed I would get my voice back. Right. I, I just knew he said he'd be with me. And so it was a really, um, even though I was excited to see what God had in store, it was a very difficult phone call to make. It was very awkward, you know, <laughs> because like I call the receptionist to his assistant yeah. and, and she's like, Hey, are you calling to prep for the surgery tomorrow? And I'm like, well, actually, I'm I'm calling to cancel. And I knew at that moment I could kind of skate by and be vague, or I could just go fully awkward and in. <laughs> and, and so I just said, I just went for it. I just said, yeah, I am canceling it. And she said, do you mind if I ask why? And I said, well, I'm. That's what I sense God tell me to do. He told me to choose story one, and she's. <laughs> There's a silence. I thought the call had gone dead because it's just awkward silence for, I don't know, it felt like a minute. And she said, okay, um, well, when you decide you want your voice back, call us back and wow. it'll be a few months before we can get you back on the schedule. But, you know, we'll, we'll do that. And hung up, we hung up and, and it just, um, it was just a, a reminder that when we choose story one, the world doesn't really know what to do with that. Like it, she wasn't trying to be rude or impolite or anything. 
And she, and, you know, she was just being probably how responding, how most people would, which is, um, this is not really how the world works. What are you, you know, what, what are you doing? Because you've got the way to healing and you're letting it go because God invited you into another story. What does that even mean? And so that was the beginning of this book. It was the beginning of a new way for me to see and understand the world around me, which was even as a believer, how often I was following the narrative of story two, thinking that's just how things work instead of seeing with new eyes what does it mean to live as a man as a as a son yeah. of god yeah in story one yeah and but but now i can hear you talking fine <laughs> right yeah you i want to hear when when you got your voice back and what what was that experience like it really i, I mean just being totally transparent with you guys like it was it was awkward it was messy it was yeah it was, it was, I started to question my own, did I really hear God right on this? Because sure. when I canceled, I went through that day and didn't hear anything more from God. It wasn't like, Hey, Alan, that was awesome. man. we are, you're on the verge of the miracle. Here we go. Like, didn't hear anything. And, um, the next day came and went, didn't hear anything. And I'm thinking, you know, it's, it's like that movie that we all see where there's that point of divergence. Like you make that choice of the road you're going to be on and everything is different from that point forward. Well, I was very aware when I canceled the surgery that next morning, instead of being in an operation, I was at home and, and that path was veering sure. from what it would have been and what it was scheduled to be to what I chose. And guys, for several days, I didn't hear anything from God. My voice didn't change. Nothing was different. And, and I just kept remembering, God, I know you didn't guarantee my voice would come back. You just offered me the guarantee of you and an adventure that I wouldn't get otherwise. And so that's what I'm holding to. I'm holding to the adventure and without any outcome that I can count on or, or know other than that you're with me and that you initiated this. And then on the third full day, I woke up and turned over in bed and said, good morning to my wife. And I had my full voice back. <laughs> and it wasn't like a little better, gradual, but it was 100%. Wow. And I hadn't done anything different. There was no, no rational um, way it would have just happened. And the doctor had told me many times, you won't, it, nothing will actually change until you get these nodules removed in your, in your vocal cords. So it was wild. It was beautiful. Uh, and it's been back. My voice has been back full strength for years. And um, it really began me again on this journey of whether my voice had come back or not. What I really had the, the greatest hunger I realized was I want to stay in story one with God. And, and if that meant I never had my voice back full strength, if that meant in half a year, God said, okay, now call that doctor back and now reschedule it and get your voice taken care of through the procedure, like that would have been fine too. I didn't want to put any restraints or any limitations on how God would heal or what he would do. I just wanted to enter into it with him. And, and so my voice coming back was a bonus. It's awesome. Uh, but the real win for me and the joy of my life is now seeing this new filter for how do we live our days? Are we, am I in story one or am I in story two? And am I viewing God as a story two God or a story one God? And, and, and that's just changed really the last two years. Almost every day there has been some practical change in how I will respond to a coworker, a friend my dreams, um, my relationship with God, all because of this new way of seeing what I believe we were created to be a part of and that was lost since Eden. Mm -hmm. 
I uh, I had two thoughts. First of all, um, if I rolled over and I wouldn't have gotten the same thing because I can't talk to my wife first thing in the morning because she'd be stupid. she'd be furious if I woke her up. That. <laughs> but uh, it would get my attention first of all. Um, if God had asked me a question, if I wanted this story or that story, this would sure get my attention and would uh, certainly, uh, I imagine was a great, great catalyst for you sitting down and getting after this book. Um, but I know you talked about how there was this invisible barrier you were running up against, uh, when you be, when you began to interact with people around this. And I was curious if that might be a, if, if you would just speak a little to that. Yeah, that was a real surprise to me It because I knew it would be awkward. Like when I called the doctor's office, um, but when I started talking to a lot of acquaintances and and friends, um, people I knew throughout life um, about what had happened, and I told them, hey, I, this was both before I got my voice back and after, but when I would talk to them, you know, hey, I've canceled this procedure because I really feel like God's inviting me into another story. Some of the early comments from believers were, well, Alan, you know, God, God gives doctors talent to, to heal people like that's, sure. you know, and I'm like, right, that that was never part of my decision or, or wrestling or anything. Oh, yeah. I just wanted to walk into it with God. Yeah. But why would God tell you not to to go get the procedure done? And, and it was it was the awkwardness was, I think it pushed against their concept of an active, unpredictable God who would would cause you to veer from kind of the way the story two world works, which is there's a pill for everything. There's a cure for, you know, the cure for this is to see a specialist in that. And if you have financial struggles, the cure is to go see a financial specialist. And if, you know, whatever it is, there's a human answer. And to push up against that and say, I actually am hearing God invite me into a different story. And then when my voice came back a few days later, like when I would tell people that I would, I just expected the same kind of sense of awe and wonder that I had like in return, not, right. not toward me, but sure. toward what, look at what God did. Right. And what would happen most of the time was I'd get kind of a blank stare. They wouldn't know what to say. And then it would be, well, Hey, um, we're going to lunch in an hour. So if you want to join us or, you know, Hey, what about the the game this weekend on TV, you know? And it was an immediate shift in conversation, which I it really puzzled me because I'm like, don't, don't we want to celebrate the wildness of a God who invites us into these stories that we couldn't script. But I later realized yeah, I think I think the whole reason why is because when you're in story two and you've come to put limitations and expectations on who God is, how he works, who we are, what we have to do when a problem happens, it's very disruptive. It's very disruptive when there's another option presented without any guarantees. Mm. And 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 so you know, people have been burned by that and there's been disappointment in, in that, but that's not a reason to stay in story two. The reason I think story two feels so ingrained besides the fact that we're born in it is every movie follows every great story tends to follow this model that you're familiar with called the hero's journey, right? And the hero's journey uh, basically is a story of us at the center we are the hero of the journey. And, and, and so we go through trials and we go through obstacles and into the unknown and we gain powers as we do. And we prevail, we battle. And in the end, we win the elixir, the, the gold, the beauty, the yeah. country, whatever. The girl. The girl. Yeah. Um, but the problem is the hero's journey and, and I used to be a fiction publisher of like 500 plus novels. And so I am well acquainted with it and understand the power of it. But the problem of it is the hero's journey works, whether God shows up or not. And, and, and often in most 
movies, God does not show up, or there is no view of the things that God values. And so the end result is a micro victory. It's a, okay, Rocky wins the fight, but in Rocky two, he's the same dude. Hmm. And Rocky three, he's the same dude. Right. And Rocky four, you know, because yeah. micro victories happen, but we stay in the wrong story. Right. And so if wow. we want to get back what was lost in Eden to reclaim what Adam and Eve relinquished, well, we have to enter into story one. We have to leave story two. And when we do, Derek, as you were saying, we get, I think, mainly four things back. And we don't get them back like in in heaven one day or in the, in the coming kingdom. We get them back today. And those things are first Eden Union. And I believe that's the foundation. That was the foundational thing that was lost in Eden was... Adam and Eve were created in paradise and we don't know how long that paradise lasted. It, it, I mean, time, I don't believe was quite like it is probably now. Um, and so that could have been eons or it could have been a matter of days or it could have been, you know, who knows, but during that time they were in complete union with God Yeah, and God was at the epicenter of everything. And when the enemy came into the garden and tempted them, he, you know, strategically caused them to start to question God's goodness. In other words, he kind of put them to be the evaluators of God and, and that started to break union. And if they had at that time gone back to God and kept intimacy and said, I don't know what, what's going on, but this intruder or this being in the garden is telling us things about you. Will you tell us what's true? then the story would have been that we're all in would be radically different. Right. But, but they chose to believe another voice, another lie. And, and that broke union first. And so long before they ate from the, the wrong tree, they had lost union by the choice to even listen to the enemy. And so the first thing we get back is Eden union. That means what is it like to see God at the center of everything we do. What is it like to be back to the vine and the branch model that we hear about where, you know, he's the vine and we're the branch, John 15. Yeah. And, you know, part of that verse that we sometimes tend to forget is we remember that if you remain in me, you will bear much fruit, but we kind of downplay, but apart from me, you can do nothing. And story two is a lot of flurry and activity that ultimately without God leads to nothing. Hmm. And, and story one, and if we go back into that union with God, all of a sudden we are operating together with him. And, and instead of doing nothing, you know, it's the Luke one, three, one thirty seven verse for with God, nothing's impossible. Like it flips the whole equation yeah. and the variable is whether we want to stay in union with God or not. And that's the heartbeat of Eden. And so Eden union is the first thing we get back. Our Eden voice, like to me, this is such a fascinating topic. And I would call it like a, a our creative roar to kind of think about it in terms of Aslan or think about it in terms of what we were born to do with who we are and, and what we speak into creation because God spoke creation into being through his voice and the enemy has always been against the voice of God as creator. That was the, the, the questioning in, you know, the temptation of, can you trust God's voice? Can you believe his voice? And, and so the enemy comes against us on that front. He comes against us in the front of who are you to have a voice? Who do you think you are? I was, I was coaching a writer just last week and and she has this beautiful gift of, of creativity and story. But she asked me, she said, Alan, you know, my biggest thing is I probably don't want to put my name on the front of the book when I write my book. And I said, well, that, why is that? Like, let's go into that. And she said, well, what kind of arrogance would I have to have to think I have anything to, to offer? Hmm. And, and who am I? to think that what my voice offers is worth anything. And, 
And so we it ended up becoming more of a counseling session <laughs> than a writing session. So I was like, well, let me tell you who you are. That's a great question. You're a right. daughter of the king. Yeah. And we went into it and and really spent a lot of time there. But the enemy tries to cause us to doubt God's voice, then doubt our own voice, all the while listening to his voice of, of fear and of, of, of doubt and of shame. And so when we get our Eden voice back, then we can actually speak in a way that changes the atmosphere around us for good. And, and not just through our literal voice, but through our gifting, our dreams, our talents. So, so the Eden voice is just to me huge. And, and one of the things that I find fascinating is Jesus, when he was in his earthly mission, his disciples asked him why he told parables. Like, why, why are you telling story? And I go into this in my book, but one of the things he says that I think is so powerful is he answers them and he says, here's why I tell stories. This is in Matthew 13, 10 through 13 in the message translation. He says, I tell stories to create readiness and to nudge people toward a welcome awakening. Well, that's what our voice is for. We use our voice, whether we're creating, you know, programming for children, whether we're doing a podcast, whether we're a barista, whether we're a stay-at-home parent, wh whatever we're a coach, whatever we do, we are able to use our voice to nudge people toward a welcome awakening and create a readiness within them. It's not condemnation. Yeah. It's not fear-based. It's love-based. Yeah, That's an entirely love-based approach for our gifting in our voice. And so when we do that, Man, our voice reverberates with strength. We are we are changing the chaos in around us into beauty and life through who we are and what we do, and that all ties to our Eden voice. So that's that's just a nutshell of that. And um, the last thing I want to say about the voice is in Matthew thirteen, Jesus goes on to say, "I will open my mouth and tell stories." I will bring out into the open things hidden since the world's first days. And that's Matthew 13, 34, 35. Mm -hmm. So guys, what an invitation. Like when we go back for our Eden voice, I mean, that scripture is saying things hidden since the world's first days. That is Eden. That is creation. God has hidden things since the beginning of creation in Eden, in the beginning for us to come alongside with him and through co-creating, through pursuing our dreams and our desires with him, we get to bring out into the open things hidden since the world's first days. It's a, it's a beautiful thing. But like with Esther, you know, in Esther 414, you know, it's the famous passage about you've been given a voice for such a time as this. And if you don't speak, I'll find another way. So if we don't reclaim, regain our Eden voice, for things hidden since the world's first days that God wants to have revealed now, he will still find the way to reveal them, just not with our voice, not with us. And so it's huge to reclaim our Eden voice. And then our Eden vision, like, man, this is huge because how we see things changes everything. Right. And that's, I think, we, we tend to stay stuck so long in story two because we see reality around us that we think is reality and define it as this is the way things work. This is just the way things are. This is just as good as it gets. I'm too old. I'm it's too late. Uh, I've sinned too much. I've, I've I'm too broken, whatever the thing is, but we start to see ourselves that way. We start to see God that way. And so how do we re see our story? How do we re see life the way God intended it to be. And um, my, my counselor is about almost 80 and he looks like Colonel Sanders. Um, and I always used to wonder when I would go to him for counseling, why am I hungry for chicken sandwiches when I leave? <laughs> and I was like, because I was with Colonel Sanders the whole time. But, but he has been in counseling for 50 plus years. And he has told me, Alan, without question, the number one longing in every human being is to be fully seen, yeah. fully known, and fully loved, right? Mm. But 
we know deep down something in us says, if anybody ever fully saw me, I couldn't be fully loved because I'm too much of a mess. I'm too dark. I'm too broken. I'm t- it's too late. And so this, this section really goes into, and yet God fully saw Adam and Eve in the garden in Eden and fully knew and loved them. And we can return to that. And so it gives us our vision back. It helps us see reality in in a new way. And when we do that, we can walk in that reality. And it helps us just be able to be who we were meant to be from the beginning. And it helps us see those that we serve, those that those in our family in that true way too. We see our sons and daughters, our students, we see the congregation, we see the people reading our books, we see the people listening to the podcast not as, you know, um, the world would define them, but as God defines them. And he gives us that vision to see correctly. And then eat and rest, guys, like this is, I just think this is huge because at the end of the day, most of us are so exhausted, wiped out, burnt out, running on fumes that we barely, you know, can get, to the end of the day and just crash and do it again. And we see sleep as a way to recharge. We don't see it as restoration. Um, We've forgotten that God has actually invited into us a story where we're not supposed to go through it exhausted. We're not supposed to go through it um, just, you know, doing the best we can to kind of drag ourselves into the moment. And so Eden rest is what did rest look like in Eden and, and how do we pursue restoration more than relief in our life? Because every time we choose the easy path of relief at the end of a long day, that turns us to overeating, um, addiction, pornography, uh, binging on Netflix, um, you know, drinking too much. It's, it's basically, or going, you know, going to the gym and we have to work out two hours every day because that's our adrenaline rush that kind of gives us our dopamine hit. Um, but all of those things leave us empty because they're, they're like sugar highs, they're relief that we ultimately cycle further downward because we become more addicted. We become more, um, convinced that we'll never have true restoration. And so the book goes into how do we restore and have true rest rather than just temporary relief that just keeps us in this cycle on a hamster wheel we can't get out of. Guys, the book is out, Leaving and Finding Jesus. I'm so excited about it. In this book, we trade a punishing God for reconciling love. We exchange the lens of retribution for the transforming revelation of God in Christ, reconciling the world to himself. Wherever you are on the journey, I really believe this book will encourage you. So it's available now on Amazon or at our website, familystory.org. Buy it, buy multiple copies, share it, and then do me a favor. If it's blessed you, write a review on Amazon. Guys, I'm so thankful for you. So thankful to be on this journey with you, praying life and joy and wonder over you today. All right, let's get back to the podcast. I love the mystery of union. Let's start there uh, because that's what burns in me. And and you started this whole conversation out about the mystery of of the voice of a friend and and your Lord inviting you into uh, to a story that had so much mystery around it. And the whole way that you're describing it is in the context of the fact that you actually have a relationship, a friendship that's already been developed. And uh, you, you quote C.S. Lewis, and I love this, and, and, and it's different than the one that you uh, mentioned, um, uh, Derek, although it's very similar. Uh, if you are on the wrong road, progress means doing an about turn and walking back to the right road. And in that case, the one who turns back soonest is the most progressive. Yes. Which is a profound, uh, profound quote uh, in, con- in the context of where we are in this moment and even the language that uh, C.S. Lewis used. But I, 
I love that union is the place that this all is birthed out of. And it's, it's why uh, so much of where you're running resonates in my heart, Alan, and why we can connect because you do know friendship is where everything starts. And, and that, and that Eden was a place of friendship. It was a place of intimacy and a place of trust. And from that place, everything flows. Uh, here's what I'm fascinated by. I, I think, and this is from a conversation I had with my heavenly father. The, the tree of life is mentioned three times in scripture. It's in the garden. Then it's in, uh, I believe in the Proverbs, right? Proverbs. And then in Revelation. Yeah. And, and I've been fascinated about these two trees, these two narratives, these two paradigms is the language I've been using. You, you've, you've changed it to the, these two stories. I love that narratives. Um, and, and the idea uh, that there is an invitation to, through Christ, through what he did at the cross, re- rediscover or reawaken to this union in which I can live in the context of uh, that, that proverb is, uh, what is it? Hope deferred makes the heart sick. But, uh-huh. but, but dreams or promises realized is the tree of life. Yes. What, what I, my father said to me one day when I was reading that, I was, I was wrestling through that and I was saying this to him. I, I said, Father, I know that hope deferred makes the heart sick because I'm heart sick. It feels like I'm living constantly in this heart sick place. The story too seems to be the thing that, that is real to me. It's the most real. I, I'm aware that these hopes continue to get deferred and I continue to feel heart sick. And his response, I want this tree of life that we're talking about. And I have to believe that it's for today and not some future place you said on earth as it is in heaven. Yes. And his response to me was, Jason, Jesus lived in, in the context of other relationships we'd had. Jesus lived from, not for. And so he said to me, Jason, you can live today in promises realized. You can live today in, in the tree of life. Today is a tree of life day. And I feel like the thing that I'm most fascinated with that we hit a hundred different angles is, man, what does it look like to live in the mystery of friendship and union? And then from that place, you, you're, you're, you're helping us go. And then you get your voice back and you get your vision. You begin to see right and you begin to know how to be restored and reconciled and you become impactful. It's such a mystery, but it's it's such a uh, and it's also that the very beginning of this conversation is such that you said, man, this is how you do it. You you do what C.S. Lewis did. You, you, I'm, I may be on the wrong road. I I hear this thing from God, and everybody else is saying that's crazy, but I'm going to lean into that place, and I'm going to lean into the trust and friendship, and move from there into this awakening to union. I'm talking a lot, but I know you can speak to the two trees because I know that's where we get to at the end of the book. And this tree of life is this thing that I'm just, I want to, I want to learn how to live from the tree of life in, in promises fulfilled and, and realized in this moment. Does that, it sounds so mystical and mysterious. I think it's called faith. Oh. I don't know. I'll stop. <laughs> talking. Well, yeah, what you're hitting on, I think Jason is huge because so much when we go back It is like where we want to drop the needle. And if we drop the needle, I know some listeners never had the joy of vinyl albums, but (laughs) but behind me, you can see, I just bought a new record player because I had all my albums from college and high school. And I'm like, I'm tired of Spotify. I'm like, it's got some, it's great. You can play a million songs or more the, you know, just click of a button, but I want to hear the scratches and the realness of something tangible and where we drop the needle in our story matters. And so we, most of us drop the needle in story two and just keep listening yeah. and letting it play. But when we go back to Eden in the garden and the trees, like one of the things I think that's essential to remember is the enemy really initiated with Eve, a knowledge based conversation mm. using the logic of a tree of knowledge, right. To draw her into it. And, and in the book, I talk about how the enemy perceived being like God, which is what he was promising them to be based solely in knowledge and power, which revealed he never understood the true heart of God. In other words, the, the enemy, I don't believe ever had true union with God. 
because he defined his, he defined being like God and saw himself as wanting to be like God through power and knowledge and force and conniving yeah. control. Yeah. Yeah, it's good. And so we have to realize the story two version of God is a conniving, controlling, distant God. The goal is knowledge, power, information. We're still tracing after the wrong tree and, and it gets us to the wrong you know, version of God. And so union is so important because intimacy with God always precedes impact for God. Yeah. A hundred percent of the time. And yet so many pastors, so many Christian leaders, so many uh, parents, fathers, mothers, like they, they try to operate from a knowledge base first. And, and so they're operating not from a tree of life, but from a, a tree of knowledge, mm. which, which God says, you have to start with the tree of life. You have to start with intimacy and union with me at the epicenter, not facts, not, not, you know, the jot and tittle of every thing that you could debate till Jesus comes back. But like, where's the love and intimacy and union and relationship? And that's story one. And story two is, no, it's knowledge, it's procedure, it's facts. It is, right. there is a way to do things. You're not going to talk well unless you get those nodes removed. Right. It's the only yeah. way. And yeah. yet the really cool thing is when I was writing the book, I didn't have this in the first draft and God reminded me right before it went to press. Hey, remember when I asked you to reach out to the surgeon and tell him what happened? And, and I had just forgotten. And so I found the email and, and this was the doctor saying the only way you'll get it back is through the procedure because right. that's been his experience. Good man. Yeah. But but I found this burning longing God gave me to reach out to him, tell him what happened. And, and it's going to be awkward because you don't know if I didn't think he would respond. And if he did respond, I didn't know what he would say. But I did. I told him, here's the story. I just wanted to share it with you. And here was his short response. Being in medicine, it gets easy to not just expect miraculous healings or to pray in such a way that you give God a way out in the event healing doesn't happen. To hear a story like yours makes me want to double down and trust more fully. Wow. Well, I mean, I sure didn't expect that kind of answer, right? But but that's that nudging people toward a receptivity and toward an awakening. It's going, I'm going to go back into story one, and now I'm going to speak with a story one voice. Wow. And, and Becca and you, who are in story two, to come into story one not out of fear, not out of a heavy handed control, but yeah. out of this is what we were created for. Yeah, man. You know, Alan, your book takes some complex subject matter and brings it to such a broad group of people. I mean, even the physical size of the book hints at its accessibility. And Derek, when I thank you, when I wrote it, I even wanted to design it in a way that would make it easy to pass out for people. Yeah, um, to hand to, to people and to read through, actually read it when they get it. So it's a six by six square, which is a different size than most books. And the chapters are two to three pages. Yep, a lot of pages just have a, a one sentence quote on the page from from C.S. Lewis or Victor Hugo or, or somebody that would bring life into this topic. But the goal is, yeah, this is not man makes things complex and God keeps things pretty simple. And so part of my desire in this book was how do I keep it easy and simple, big ideas, but, but in a way that anybody from your, you know, 16 year old son or daughter to your 85 year old parent could read it or neighbor. Um, and, and that's my hope is this is a winsome invitation to go. If the story you're in isn't working, the good news is you're not the problem. The story is the problem. Mm. So, so choose the better story, choose the truer story, because you're never going to do enough in story two to make it the right story. Yeah. You can live your whole life as an overachiever in story two, and you still are in the wrong story. Yeah. Alan, why is it so important to go back to Eden? Well, in what you're going back to the beginning is the only way that works because 
If not, we go back to certain periods of time and it's like, well, it's the, you know, the Reformation or it's or it's the evangelical church versus the or Catholics versus or the Jewish faith versus this. And it's like and none of those things existed in Eden. Guess what, guys? None of those things existed in Eden. Yeah. And so we have to go back, back, back to God's intention, not. Well, yeah, but in the 12th century and the 8th century and the like, okay. And part of, you know, you're talking about renewing the mind, renew. Well, I also love the word respect because respect means to re-see, spect, spectacle. So we have to respect our story enough to re-see it the way God sees it. Yeah. And when we re-see it, respect it, we find ourselves going, actually, it sounds too good to be true, but everything could change if I put myself in the right story. If I go back to the story I was born for, which was paradise was not the fall. Yeah. You know, we weren't born for Ecclesiastes. Yeah. We were born for Eden. Yeah. And, and it takes away all the doctrinal, you know, tangled things that people trip up on yeah. because in Eden, there was not, there was not a lot of that. There was more, there was union. Yeah. Yeah. Man, most of my Christian faith, I was taught to live from the beginning and the beginning was the fall. And, and I, I gotta be honest in the last 12 years, what's probably been the most profound is that, and, and you do do this in the book. You actually talk about, uh, that Jesus, I loved it that you talked about Jesus was there at the beginning and you spend a little bit of time, um, uh, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't the, it was a triune God there in the beginning that you, that you described. But in the last 12 years or so, I think what has shifted in me is that I found the beginning and the beginning was Eden. And Jesus was the revelation of the, the, the restoration of Eden and the invitation to live again in that place. And you're right that that's, that's the only that's the, that's what Derek talked about when you, when you take everything down and you find the cornerstone and it's Jesus. And, uh, I, I love, I love how attractive it is. I love that it isn't in this place. You don't have to manipulate or like you said, that we don't have to debate doctrine and it's so attractive. Love is our native tongue. It's, it's what it, it, you hear it spoken and something in you comes alive because it is the original, uh, it is the original native tongue. We were born, we're born again to rediscover is, is the way I write about it. And so I do love that, man. I, 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 um, well, we're, we're at an hour, so <laughs> we could do this a little longer, I'm sure. But I didn't want to. I didn't want to. I want to give you a little bit of time to talk about what it is you're dreaming into with this book. And uh, oh, I, and it is a winsome book, by the way. It is. I, I've got it too. Winsome is the right word. What are you dreaming about for it? What What's your hopes for uh, these days ahead? Where are you speaking and sharing and and working on right now? Yeah. Well, man, that's a great question. I love the topic of dreams and and where God is stirring our hearts. And for me. I see this book as a passport into all types of speaking opportunities, conversations. Um, I'm going to uh, speak to a church uh, in the Outer Banks oh. in just a bit. And um, their whole staff is going through this, the worship team, the elders, the leaders. And then I'm, I'm preaching on Sunday. And, and I'm not a, I'm not a preacher by, you know, like I haven't gone to seminary, but I'm happy to talk about Eden and God and life and our dreams in a new way with people. And so the book is opening up opportunities to, to do that. Um, but it's also to me a beautiful chance for people to see themselves in a new way. And as a guy who's always grown up in love story and became a publisher, well, now to help people not just write a better story or read a better story, but live a better story, like live the true story. Yeah. And so I found with this book, the ability to get in front of businesses, talk to their marketing teams um, about how to tell a better story Right. to, you know, besides churches, you know, like creatives who are wanting to create like we were born to create in Eden. 
rather than try to create in a way that's striving and that that is kind of surface deep. How do you go after the deepest longing for people to be fully seen, fully known, fully loved? If you want to interest them in a genuine service or piece of art or offering, well, make sure that that thing helps them be fully seen, known and loved to start to feel that spark that it's possible, whatever you do. Yeah. And so, guys, it's just been um, I've seen doors really open with this and. That's all. And I'm excited to just go where God leads with it, but it's, it's creating new, new opportunities. And, you know, I'm going, God, this is a big road trip and I'll take a year of road trips with you in conversations, wherever you want to take me. That sounds fun, Alan, a year of road trips with God actually reminds me of a CS Lewis quote that joy is the serious business of heaven. Yep. I th- there's a little bit of Narnia in the book too. I think you quote the horse and his boy. Yeah. And there's a, there's a part where, uh, when I'm talking about our voice, I go into the part in Narnia where Aslan opens his, uh, mouth and roars and creation is born <laughs> and, and, and kind of re, uh, tell that quote C.S. Lewis in that to talk about our creative roar. But the, the biggest thing when you're talking about Narnia and wonder in the wardrobe and story, yeah, that's like, it is that because Victor Hugo, who wrote Les Mis, talks about the priest. He describes this, this priest as a man, not so much who studied God, but was dazzled by God. Mm-hmm. And, and that's what I want. I want yeah. to reawaken people's wonder for God and awe, because if we are more in awe of anything in this world than God, if I'm more in awe of my voice, getting my voice back than the fact that God is a God who created our voice and can restore it, mm. then I've missed the whole invitation. Yeah. Like if it's like, well, I needed my voice back and God gave it back and wow, I can't quit talking about my voices back, but I don't talk about the awe and wonder of God. Yeah. I, you know, I missed the whole thing. And I was, I was reading just the other day in Luke and there were two different healings that happened and miraculous things in a chapter. And in that chapter, I just found it fascinating that in both cases, people were in awe and wonder at what Jesus had done. But I found in my own heart, this almost a a sorrow for God. I'm sorry. They weren't more in awe of you than what, than what had been done. Like the miraculous catch of fish is awesome. The healing of the man on the mat is awesome but more than the healing of the man or the the bounty of fish you're the god who created the whole thing like so i think we've lost in story 2 our ability to even have wonder and awe over who god is hmm. and we're not fascinated by him we just at best are fascinated by the gifts that he gives and the gifts are good but like the eden invitation is and let's be in awe and let's be curious about God again yeah. and, and get to know him intimately. And that, that's been lost, I think, since Eden largely. I think uh, we've talked about folks, whatever language you want to put around it. Um, I wasn't a big fan of the word deconstruction when it came out, but it's, I see it now as just an, another way of to describe the faith journey. And I think many who are navigating that are looking for story one and some are finding it. Uh, they've, been, they've been distracted by story two that very much exists within our institutional models of church as well. And so, and so I think that's what's happening is there's, there's a hunger to find that original story, the one we were designed, the, the creator we were designed in his image and likeness. And, and well, and so many people, so many times, you know, the very ones who are red faced in their, debate about some doctrinal position uh when you get with them one-on-one and and you start talking and say well when is the last time um you heard the voice of god or or tell me a story where god has come for your heart recently right you just get you you just get a blank stare yeah because they have traded union or intimacy for for data and information yeah. and yeah. I mean the whole purpose of scripture is to lead us to union, not yeah. to not to um dissect yeah. scripture. 
And so I, I just find a lot of times that if union is not at the heartbeat of what we're after, then it's only a matter of time until we have left Eden and left the tree of life yeah. for the tree of knowledge. Yeah. Yeah. My, uh, and my 16 year old, she just bought herself a record player because she wants to hear vinyl because they actually do want the real thing. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good sign. This generation coming that they, 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 yeah, we got technology. We got a billion ways to connect without actually connecting heart to heart. And, and that's what they're hungry for. My, my, I got, she just bought me vinyl yesterday. She came home and bought, brought me home, uh, uh, U2's, um, uh, uh, which record is uh, Unforgettable Fire. She called me, she said, dad, Unforgettable oh, Fire is here. Do you want it? I'm like, yeah, bring it home. We'll listen to it on, <laughs> on your, on your album or on your, uh, record player, but that's what we want. And that's what they want. So I'm thankful, bro, that you've written this. Uh, we need, uh, wise voices, those, who have, who have said yes and have the stories to say, listen, I was uncomfortable, but I canceled the surgery because I'm, I'm hungry for something authentic, something real. And, and the, those, we need voices like that, this generation coming, and I need them in my life. Voices of friends who say, yeah, I'm, I'm willing to risk just to say yes uh, to the mystery of, of his love. Um, before we, we, uh, you need to share a little bit about where we're going to find you, but uh, I we've used a lot of time. You and I had tacos a couple of years ago, and it's one of my favorite memories. Uh, we went skiing with my son, drove down, had tacos with you and your wife. And uh, but is there a taco story you have for us? Well, so I'll tell you. Yeah, I'll tell you a taco story. Um, I am. I mean, Mexican food really. It's not like it's one of many choices. It's really the only choice for me. It's the only. I think it is manna. <laughs> and uh and so a friend of mine recently tried to talk me i always get fajitas fajita meat and tacos and and just yeah yeah you know and a friend of mine tried to talk me into doing something different because i was too predictable and so he said you need to get chili rellenos next time and i did and and uh i was original and it and i it was the biggest mistake i ever made in my life and <laughs> you can't put that in tacos you can't so I, I'm just here to tell you, I am happy being the predictable guy that will always order steak fajita tacos. I don't care what new thing is on the menu. Um, I'm going with what I love. And that's Derek, have we ever had a, have we ever had a story where the taco story was a mistake? Never. <laughs> never, never. Hey, I love you too. Yes, that's right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, oh, brother. guys, yeah, hey. for, thank you for the conversation. If if people do want to get the book, it is on Amazon, yeah. uh, in ebook or in print. And I also uh, would encourage people if they want to just kind of have daily encouragement on God and creativity and their dreams. I offer a free daily reading. Each one is like a paragraph, a couple of sentences. It can be read in less than a minute. And it comes to your email and they can get that if they go to with Allen, W-I-T-H-A-L-L-E-N dot com backslash sign up, sign dash up. And um, there's no commitment to that other than I just want to encourage people in their journey. And so we talk about creativity, but we also talk about worldview. We talk about pop culture. We talk about uh, even fajitas here and now and then, but it's always from a concept of and a starting point of getting to know God more, more intimacy with God yeah. and the things we love. Yeah, very encouraging uh, as well. I follow you and uh, love love what you post. Thanks, guys. Yeah, bro. Thanks. Love having you on. Good to see you. Great conversation. Hey, guys. We're so glad that you are joining us. You can find me, Derek Turner at rivercharlotte.com that's my church and i'm on all the social medias yes. as pastor derek t d-e-r-e-k pastor derek t i'm also on twitter uh at jason clark is uh and you can find all of these podcasts including season one on all of the platforms apple uh, spotify, spotify uh, all the places all the places you can also go to a familystory.org 
and everything's there. If you sign up for our mailing list, we send out a weekly email that has uh, articles, podcast information, and uh, we also let you know about new books coming out or events that we're uh, connected to. So yeah. uh, like, share, retweet, and uh, and man, if you could write a review, it, it actually does something for the rankings. It, it, it does, it yeah. Available, so. But a five-star review, of course. <laughs> yes. You know, if you can't write a five-star review or something... <laughs> Like, just don't even write don't, a review. Don't worry, don't worry about it. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of like, if you can't say something nice, don't say anything, don't say at, anything all. at all. I, I like that. And then apply that to this <laughs> podcast. Definitely. That's my motto. That's I like what I do. I love it. So love you guys. Appreciate you coming on the ride with us. God bless. <laughs>